Okay, good morning. Sorry, I didn't uh, actually budget it for a lecture hall. I thought that, you know, it would be more seminar-like. So, um, you know, because I, I've seen that all of you have got, uh, you know, a very direct research interest in European identity, what I didn't want to do is a sort of, you know, uh, undergraduate type lecture where I actually tell you everything wonderful about uh, the work of all the academics in the field. And I thought that, you know, I wanted something which would be a little bit more um, engaging. So I thought that, you know, uh, hopefully you will help me here and actually uh, participate a lot. And that also means that even though I'll start really introducing what I want to tell you, please do feel free to interrupt me at any time, ask questions, make comments. Uh, and after the while, I hope that it will become increasingly interactive. Um, so uh, Victoria and uh, Pavel asked me to, uh, Irene asked me to um, introduce you, I guess, to one of the less obvious aspects of the study of European identity, which is the sort of quantitative approaches to European identity. Uh, and I think that when we had the um, uh, seniors make critique yesterday, and you know, some of you asked uh, a lot of interesting questions, I think that I already started telling you a little bit about the whole difficulty of actually measuring identities and why it's so difficult for us. I mentioned one case, which is that uh, very often when I actually say that, you know, we do try to understand how European different people feel, and we actually try and find out quantitative measures that will allow us to compare them across individuals. Um, I always have a lot of people answering to me, there is really no point. Uh, we shouldn't even be trying to capture identities. Uh, and the reason why we shouldn't be trying to capture identities is that, in the words of a philosopher called Peter Burgess, uh, the problem with identity is that it's prisoner of language. And when he says that identity is prisoner of language, what he really means is that if you want the problem with identity is that we don't normally think of it in analytical terms continuously. If you ask me, who are you, which is the sort of most obvious identity question, I say, well, I'm Michael, right? That's the way I think of myself. And if you actually try to actually make me step out of that comfort zone, which is the zone where I sort of take my identity for granted, then almost necessarily we are moving into a territory which is not going to be a very natural territory for human beings. In other words, you ask them to actually express who they are using concepts which are not very natural to them and which they might not have thought of uh, in such words and in such ways on a daily basis. And I took an example yesterday, which was the example of people asking me, where do you come from? Which again is a very spontaneous way of trying to uh, approximate the real identity of people. And some people say, you know, just ask people, where do, you, where do you come from? And then you'll see what they answer and their answer will be the real thing they feel about their identity. And as I told you, uh, if you ask me where I come from, uh, one day I'll tell you I'm French, another day I'll tell you that I'm from London, a third I'll tell you that I'm from Nice, and it will really depend on what I expect you to be really asking me, depending on who you are, what we have in common, the context in which you ask me such a sim apparently simple question. And that just makes it very difficult uh, to actually make people express their identity in a way which would be uh, directly usable, if you want, for us social scientists. Now, uh, we've got two ways of doing things on that basis. Either we just give up and we say, let's not measure identity. Let's just joke about people's identities based on what we think is true uh, without actually empirically testing it. Or we only rely on narratives where, again, people might be giving us a lot of interesting information about their identity, but which might be harder to compare. And uh, the third possibility is we try anyway, and we try knowing, and that will be my proviso before the start of our seminar, uh, we start knowing from the start that we are wrong, and that whatever we are going to find is not a perfect approximation of people's identity, whether European identity, national identity, or anything else. Now, obviously, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, what I'm talking to you about is how can we actually try and measure identity quantitatively, knowing that we will be wrong to some extent, that there will be some error in what we get, but trying to minimize that error, or at the very least to try and understand what error is going to bias our results. Now, again, uh, as I mentioned, in defense on, of quantitative methods, uh, even though we know we are wrong, I do also think that any other way of doing it is wrong as well. 
uh, and as I mentioned, all these expressive narrative measures of identities will also be wrong to some extent. And the reason why they are wrong is very simple. Uh, it is simply the fact that as uh, social psychologists know, and as even philosophers know, uh, much of identity is subconscious anyway. So if you actually ask people to tell you about who they are, they will actually give you something which is necessarily uh, lagged, if you want, as compared to what they really feel. Now, let me give you two examples. Uh, and these examples are really, uh, will tell you that in a way, uh, whether you use quantitative or qualitative methods, you are wrong anyway. At least uh, it will make you feel better and sleep at night. I can't remember which of you had a problem finding sleep at night uh, with a research. I think it was you, but, uh, you know, uh, hopefully that will sort of de-dramatize things a little bit. Um, one qualitative and one quantitative example. Uh, the quantitative example is a very famous commercial example from the 1980s, whereby uh, progressively Coke, you know, the drink, uh, ended up losing lots of market shares. Progressively, it emerged that people preferred Pepsi, and they liked Pepsi better because Pepsi was sweeter, and, uh, you know, they started, well, freaking out about it, if you want. They say, well, you know, we're the world leader in the field of cola drinks, and, you know, we need to actually uh, get over Pepsi. We can't let them win. So let's have a big market study, quantitative, asking people what they want best, you know, what they like best. We'll have some blind tastings of uh, different drinks, and we'll find the best possible recipe for Coke. So they hire these very expensive marketing firms, which organize some blind testings of Coke, and people, you know, tried various Cokes, and it was confirmed that indeed, when you have sweeter taste, uh, people like it better. So Coke said, well, that's the recipe for our fight back against Pepsi, and they introduced a new Coke. And the new Coke was sweeter than the old Coke, and it corresponded to the taste that people like best in color drinks, and in a few months, uh, their sales plummeted uh, instead of increasing. And they realized that people, when you were giving them that drink which supposedly they liked best, they didn't actually buy it. And Coke had to actually move back, cancel the new Coke, reintroduce the old Coke, which became original Coke, and suddenly their sales actually started picking up again. Quantitative approach, trying to understand what people are and what people want, at least in that particular case, gives you a result which, when you actually try to put it in practice, doesn't really work. Alternative model is a qualitative model, uh, which is about uh, a study of speed dating by a psychologist called uh, Iyengar. Uh, you've all heard of speed dating. It's a case of you know, people being asked what they are looking for in the perfect partner, and they actually give you uh, loads of explanations about you know, what they are looking for, and they are giving you loads of explanations about who they are, and then uh, they actually end up going in you know, uh, meeting rooms or round tables, and they end up meeting different people. They speak for a few minutes, I can't tell you how long. Uh, and then, you know, after that, they move to the next partner, and they make little notes, and they tell you uh, who they like, what they think of the other people, and who they want to actually meet again. Lots of descriptions, very interesting, about who people think they are and what they think they're looking for in a perfect partner. And when uh, Iyengar did a research, he finds out that when you compare that with what people actually think of each other and who they actually choose, people are perceived very differently from who they say they are. So in other words, their description of themselves doesn't match their identity as perceived by others. And secondly, they choose people who are very different from the people they say they are looking for. So again, when you try to do something qualitative instead of quantitative, again, you get a very significant discrepancy between what people actually tell you, even using the sort of lengthier and more detailed and more open narratives uh, than what you actually do in real life. So that's the conundrum we are dealing with here. And in order to approach that conundrum, uh, I want to introduce a few conceptual reminders. Now, obviously, uh, it's what, about 20, 25 of us in the room. Uh, not any two of us would agree on what identity actually means. And that's perfectly normal. I mean, conceptual debates are a healthy basis of social science discussions. But at least we might sort of agree on what identity is not. Uh, there are a number of things, again, when people actually try to capture identity quantitatively, um, the tradition within political science and sociology was to say European identity and support for European integration are the same thing. 
that, I think we can agree is not the case. So the traditional model, if you want, which presided over the build-up of European identity questions in big surveys, such as the World Value Survey, Eurobarometer, the European Value Survey, was that assumption that if you actually support European integration, it probably means that you feel European, and if you feel European, it probably means that you support European integration. That you can start from uh, a very simple uh, answer here, it's not the case. These things are conceptually different, they are empirically different. Um, one thing we know we can't do if we want to capture European identity um, uh, quantitatively, we cannot just use support for European integration as a proxy, let alone, of course, perceived benefits of integration. The second thing that European identity is not is pride. Uh, when we talk about identity and how difficult it's it is to measure uh, quantitatively and empirically, I always have a lot of people who say, well, then don't measure identity, measure pride. That's a good proxy for identity. Ask people if they are proud of being European. If they say yes, it probably means that they feel European. If they say no, it probably means that they don't. Now, I'll just give you back uh, a little summary uh, about a discussion I had with a Norwegian colleague of mine a few years ago uh, about that. It was one of those people arguing that, you know, uh, if we measured proud, pride, and if people are proud of being European, it probably means that they feel European. And if they don't feel proud of being European, it probably means that they don't. We started having that discussion. I was saying, no, it's not the same thing. And he was telling me, yes, it is. And then suddenly he sort of froze. And he told me, hang on a minute. I think you're right. Because the moment I feel most Norwegian is when I'm on the plane and half the people are trying to get drunk before the plane even leaves the tarmac. And that's something I don't actually thought of it that way, but which actually was very meaningful to me because, you know, one of the moments when I know I am French is when I sit, for instance, in a coffee shop in London and I've got some French people next to me and they start complaining, whine, whining about, you know, uh, how the British can't actually prepare any proper food and how disgusting everything tastes here and everything. And I feel really ashamed. And I feel ashamed because I'm French. I wouldn't feel ashamed in the same way if those people were Portuguese or German or Italian or Korean. I wouldn't mind. I would laugh at it. But because I'm French, actually sort of take it personally. And in a way, I would argue that sometimes uh, feelings of shame can be a stronger marker of identity than feeling of pride. And at the very least, if you want to actually use the two of them as uh, feelings that are connected, if you want, with identity, then you should probably take the two of them together. You know, just think of it even at a personal level. Uh, is it not the case that the people who are most likely to make you feel ashamed are people from your family? when they behave in a way which you wouldn't really want or which embarrasses you and so on. Yes, it is. And it is because precisely, you know, you are part of the family and therefore it's meaningful to you in a way which uh, wouldn't be if you were not identifying with that. And probably even if you didn't know that a little part of you could actually have the stupid reactions which you actually see in family members and, and actually resent uh, when they express them. So identity is not the same as support for integration. Identity is not the same as pride. Identity is not the same as allegiance either. Again, that's another thing that people say a lot. I mean, for some reason, it's become a sort of huge trend in quantitative studies of European identity, and one which I admit I don't really understand. People say, don't ask people about how they feel. Ask them, if there was a war between your country and the European Union, who would you fight with? I think that, you know, people are sort of, you know, uh, getting these sort of playful ideas that wars must be a good way of measuring things. I think it's rather too dramatic for it. But... Ultimately, if there was a war between France and the European Union, I'm sort of scared now because I know I'm being recorded, uh, I, would probably, <laughs> I would probably fight with the European Union. And it doesn't really mean that you know, I feel more European than France. It just means that probably I would have this sort of perception that if you know, 27 member states uh, say one thing and one says something else, then we're probably wrong and the others are probably right. Uh, it doesn't really mean something about my identity. It means something about you know, my sense of you know, the fact that maybe together we make fewer mistakes, really. So even allegiance, I think, is not really a good proxy of European identity. So all that to actually uh, sort of give you, by default, if you want, a sort of uh, broad general map of what European identity is or where it might actually sit, just by contrasting it to what it's definitely not. Now, why would we want to actually measure European identity quantitatively considering all those difficulties? Um, the first reason is that 
while narratives might be very enriching, and they definitely are, um, there is, by definition, a problem of what we call external validity or generalizability when we actually use evidence which is purely qualitative. Now, again, uh, by the end of the session, you might tell me, yeah, but when you actually do uh, quantitative analysis, there might be a problem of internal validity with many of the measures that we use, and therefore that's not perfect either. But uh, at least, you know, the reason, the rationale before trying our best at still capturing um, quantitative measures of uh, European identity is that, you know, we want to be able to bring some element of external validity, some element of generalizability that we couldn't really get otherwise. There is a second reason, which is perhaps even more important, even though it's less methodological. Um, it's great to actually try and understand what European identity is. I'm fascinated by it. I could talk about it for hours, days, you know, uh, name your timeline. Uh, but comes a point when it becomes a bit circular as well. I mean, you know, we don't just leave as social scientists to describe something. Uh, comes the point when we actually want to actually see how something interacts with other uh, variables in the real world. We want to understand where it comes from. We want to understand what it causes. And the problem with uh, being only qualitative in the way we study identity is that, you know, it can give us a better and increasingly, you know, more satisfactory understanding of what people might mean by their Europeanness, which is very important. But it's very difficult to use in models where identity is either a dependent variable, in other words, something which we try to explain, or an independent variable, even more so, in other words, something uh, which is about, you know, why does it matter? What's the impact of European identity on anything else? And yet it does. And it does uh, <clears throat> in the following ways, for instance, when we actually look at the impact of support for European integration on whether people are likely to vote in European Parliament elections, it doesn't matter, it doesn't work. But when we actually look at the impact of feeling European on whether they are likely to vote in European Parliament elections, it does. Uh, there are a number of models whereby we actually have um, apparent impact of support for European integration on other variables, which just don't make sense logically. And when you actually replace support for integration by uh, measures of European identity, it works better, and it also makes more sense because sometimes your identity might have a stronger, a more logical impact, if you want, on, for example, what you're willing to accept from a political community when you disagree with specific outputs of the community in question. Now, this is very close to one uh, empirical concept in I'm using empirical concept on purpose here because, again, you know, the sort of uh, conceptual concept, if you want, we can discuss for a long time. But empirically, uh, most of political science agrees on the sort of Estonian definition of legitimacy, which is that an institution is legitimate when people are willing to accept that institution and the decisions that it makes, even when it, they disagree with the decision in question. In other words, there is a specific support for a decision, which is, you know, yes, I agree with, um, you know, uh, the current British government uh, deciding to impose the so-called bedroom tax um, on people who live in uh, social housing in flats which are bigger than one they need. Well, no, I don't agree with it. But there is also what they call, what we call diffuse support which was the willingness to still accept the legitimacy of the government, even if I disagree with that specific decision. And that diffuse support is the measure we use operationally in most political science models to assess the legitimacy of um, a given institution. That's what you could call, if you want, the reservoir of goodwill. Um, and in that same way, uh, we could consider that identity, in terms of the effects it has on people, might be the sort of thing which makes us still accept a human community or a political community despite being offended or alienated by what results from it. Again, that's what I was telling you about uh, the sort of family uh, shame uh, model. We might actually be ashamed of our family members behaving in such and such way, but at the same time, uh, we are still feeling part of the family nonetheless. So if you want, 
um, we are not just breaking up with our family just because we do something which uh, we disagree with. That's the sort of you know, uh, legitimacy equivalent at the uh, family level to, um, to the institutional one. So that's sort of setting the scene. Uh, we know what, what European identity is not. It's a good start. At least part of what it's not. We know why we probably want to measure it uh, quantitatively. The reason is that, in a way, measuring it qualitatively would have its shortcomings as well, and quantitatively would have shortcomings as well, but they might be different ones. And also the fact that we actually want to be able to use European identity in models where it will either be explained by other things or will explain other things itself. And from that point of view, that's something which implies that we've got measures that we can use in broader context, if you want, uh, and not in isolation from uh, other variables and other studies. Now, how do we do it? You remember what I mentioned about the new Coke and what I mentioned about speed dating? Um, the problem in any aspect of social psychological measurement, and in a way uh, in political science, when we actually subscribe to uh, methodological individualism, we sort of subscribe to social psychological um, biases, if you want methodological biases, more than we do to sociological ones in many ways. Uh, the problem is that if you actually want to understand how people uh, rank on a given scale, you shouldn't ask them directly. Because if you do ask them directly, they will actually tell you something which is going to be very different, very distant, if you want, from the variable you try to measure. Let's take a very simple example. I want to figure out how many of you in this room are racist. I hope very few, but you know, that's not, uh, you know, that wouldn't be an absurd question per se. Obviously, if I do ask you, are you racist? The answers which I'm going to get are going to measure a hell of a lot of things. And whether or not you're racist will only be a very tiny part of it. So if I actually ask you questions in those words, which are the words of the researcher and not the words of the subject, then I'm doing, I'm committing, if you want, a cardinal sin, which is that I'm actually being lazy and trying to actually uh, impose a certain number of conceptual categories upon you, knowing that as a result, my measurement will be tainted by a lot of bias, which might include such things as acquiescence, your willingness to please me, uh, social desirability, your knowledge that it's not a very good thing to be perceived as a racist and therefore that you would like to avoid uh, being uh, considered one. And if I only use those questions, which are typically the types of questions which you will find in marketing surveys or commercial surveys, then you know that what you are going to capture are a number of things which might be completely different from, you know, uh, whether or not the individuals I'm talking to are racist or not. Now, on the other hand, if I could observe your reaction, for instance, when your son or your daughter ends up telling you that they go out with a black person, for instance, if I could compare your reaction when you are giving uh, an order at work by a black boss as opposed to a white boss, then I would probably have a sense of whether you're a racist or not, because in a way, uh, the way in which you are acting would betray some things which you don't want to tell me, and also some things which you are not capable of telling me. So the whole concept of measuring things which are not natural measures, if you want, and identity is in very many ways one of them, is that what we need to do is to trap the identity of people using questions which do not directly ask them about them. Of course, we also need to ask them identity questions directly. The reason for it is that the way people, again, you know, go back to what I was telling you about Burgess, in a way, if identity is expressive, then the way people speak about themselves will tell us also something about whether they feel European or not. But it cannot tell us everything about whether people feel European or not. Now, I've finished uh, about my sort of you know, brief introduction.
and still on the record. I'm now going to proceed to explain to you why the main measures we have, uh, in particular in your, in your barometer, are not measures which I think do a good job at measuring European identity. Um, how does this thing work? Can I actually draw on it, or is it, does anybody know? It's not urgent, but you know, if there is a, uh, I, I might, I will probably want to use it in a few minutes. Let's put it that way. So you know, if, if I can, it does look very fancy and and clever, but you know, uh, there is always a risk that one is more likely to destroy something fancy and clever than than a sort of stupid blackboard with a piece of chalk. Um, Eurobarometer. The traditional question we have is what people uh, call uh, regularly the Moreno question, uh, which asks people um, in the near future. Do you see yourself as German only, German and European, European and German, or European only? That's the most traditional question which we've had very regularly in your barometer, in the World Value Survey, in the European Value Survey, and in many other uh, surveys which are broadly available in um, existing publicly available data sets. That question raises a, a lot of potential problems. The first one is that, as you have noticed, it goes on a scale which goes from European identity to national identity. And by doing that, it assumes a tension between national and European identity, which we simply don't know is there, even before uh, recent research, which I'm going to talk to you about. In other words, you assume that the opposite of feeling European is not not feeling European, but you assume that the opposite of feeling European is feeling German. Uh, and again, the reason why you would assume that is because that question, in many ways, has been inherited uh, from the Eurobarometer tradition of, oh, thank you. Oh, cool. Perfect, thank you. Um, so, um, I'm just going to try it just because it looks like fun. Uh, and that way you can sort of see how unreadable my handwriting is. So, um, so okay, we've got that um, German only. German and European, European and German, or European only. I'm not going to do much good like that, but uh, let's try anyway. So, um, first issue, you assume that tension between European and national identity because, again, in post-materialist tradition, in the words of Engelhardt, European identity equals support for European integration, European identity equals support for European integration, equals cosmopolitanism, and therefore, uh, and equals post-materialism, by the way, and therefore the definition of European identity in the article where Engelhardt speaks about it is really a non-identity. In a way, you know, it's either you feel, either you have an identity which is by definition a national identity, or you don't, you are cosmopolitan, you are modern, you are post-materialist, and therefore you feel European. That's his definition of European identity. Again, there is a big problem in assuming something like that, because, uh, again, if we look at social psychological research on identity, they tell us that typically, uh, if there is any scale at all in terms of peoples and identities, is that there are identifiers and there are non-identifiers. There are people who don't identify with anything, and there are people who identify with lots of things. And the reason why we identify with lots of things um, is because it's a way of actually simplifying our world. I mean, that's the sort of, you know, social, psychological, uh, traditional definition of prejudice, that, in a way, uh, we need prejudice in order to simplify a world which is too big, too complex, uh, too unmanageable for us. And identity is one such prejudice. It's a way of actually thinking of ourselves as something which is just reassuring, which sort of places us in the world and prevents us from having to wake up every morning asking us again the same questions. Well, some of us do it anyway, but not all of them. Uh, and, you know, that's the point of identity. And as a result, social psychologists will tell us that people who do tend to feel French, they are probably also likely to feel European. They are also likely to actually feel, you know, a Londoner or Berliner or whatever you want. They are also likely to feel Christian or Jewish or Muslim. They are also likely to actually have uh, some form of identification with their job, with you know, their race, with their gender, with anything you want. So in other words, there are people who need a little bit more self-placement, if you want, using uh, those identity pointers. So, first problem, that sort of assumption. 
The second problem is one which is related again to the phrasing of the question itself. Remember what I told you the question was? In the near future, protective dimension, do you see yourself as German only, German and European, European and German, or European only? See yourself as, what does it mean? It's not really a question about identity, not necessarily. It's projective, we know that, but it could equally be a factual question. Uh, it could really be a question about, you know, what you think the future has in store for you. And when we do pilot, when we do qualitative pilot about how people actually perceive this question, we actually find that a majority of people think that it's actually a predictive question rather than an identity question. And that in itself raises a very significant concern about the validity of the question, because if that's the case, then people will be answering different things depending on what they hear with that question. And all the more so that, as uh, you obviously know, Eurobarometer is a survey which is asked in many countries, and in different languages, the translation of that question can actually vary a great deal. And in some languages, it sounds like it has a more identity uh, orientation, if you want, and in other languages, definitely a more predictive orientation. And as such, what you are doing is that you're really creating an artifact, creating international variance based not on differences of identity between people from different countries, but instead based on linguistic differences between uh, how you would translate how do you see yourself as in a number of different languages. So, second problem. This problem is this sort of European national tension scale. Second problem is that notion of see yourself as. Third problem, pretty obvious. So in the near future, do you see yourself as? And remember this time the possible answers. German only, German and European, European and German, or European only. And. What is and? I mean, and is not more. And is and. I mean, typically, in most languages, European and German and German and European mean exactly the same thing. Uh, there is no natural element of prioritization in the word and. Is it a problem? Maybe not. Maybe yes. How do we figure out? Well, we figure it out in a very simple way, by doing an experimental, um, a measurement experiment where we ask the question to two subsamples of the population. Half of the people will be asked, in the near future, do you see yourself as German only, German and European, European and German, or European only? And the other half sample will be asked, in the near future, do you see yourself as European only, European and German, German and European, or German only? In other words, exactly the same question, exactly the same answers. The only thing you change is the order in which you propose the different answers. And when you do that, the distribution changes significantly. There is a transfer between European and national, and national and European in excess of 20%. And that actually affects in several member states which category is actually the top category. So in other words, in some countries, if you actually start with European, you will draw the conclusion that people actually feel mostly European and secondarily German. And if you actually ask the question in reverse order, you'll draw the conclusion that people feel mostly German and secondarily European. That's not good, in case you hadn't noticed. Uh, that's not what we want from um, you know, quantitative measure. What we want is measures which are right or wrong, problematic, certainly, but at least robust. We don't want measures which will stop working the moment you actually change the order in which um, the various options are being proposed to respondents. So, how do we do it? Ooh, uh, it's complicated, uh, and there are many different ways of doing it. And part of it is related to the way in which we disentangle, if you want, some of the conceptual and analytical problems which um, I wanted to uh, tell you about. And I'm going to tell you that in a minute, but before I go there, because you've all been very nice, but also very silent. Has anybody got any comment or question about, in particular, the Eurobarometer question or the sort of setup, or shall we move on to the 
the next part. Again, I mean, just feel free to jump in anytime anyway, but I thought I would re-invite you. Yeah. Okay. Right. Or national others follow and that they that seem to have some kind of faith in in the Okay. I don't know your thoughts about that. I don't think you need to see. Well, I think that you know it it would definitely um get rid of one of the problem, which is the sort of and uh, question, definitely. Um, it wouldn't necessarily get rid of some of the other, yeah? Okay. So you also, you know, yes. you also get around the second problem, which is nice. Um, I mean, there I would have, a, 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 this being said, I would have another problem with uh, the way you do it. Uh, that's the sort of quantitativist, um, you know, uh, bias, if you want, which is that, in my world, we should never collapse variants. In other words, uh, when you have people giving different answers, and you actually put them together in one part, if you want, um, you're probably erasing something which might actually have some meaning. Now, this being said, I think it's a problem, but I think it's less of a problem than the problem of your barometer. So, you know, if I had to choose between what you're doing uh, and the way your barometer uh, you know, people analyze the answers to their question, I would probably choose your version. But I would say that if all you want to know is whether there is a European ingredient, then I would argue that there would be questions which, you know, would capture that uh, a little bit more. Uh, okay. Well, I think that, you know, that, that's the other thing as well. Um, another very important thing, which again differentiates us in academic surveys from marketing surveys or commercial surveys. Uh, anytime we want to indulge in psychometric measurement, in other words, measurement of something which is not as straightforward as your age, for instance, or your gender, or something like that, you know, things which age, gender, people can say, well, yes, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm 35, I'm 26, whatever. Anything which is more complex, like identity, uh, one thing which is an absolute no-goer is to use a single question to measure something. Because any question we use will always be biased, will always be different from what we try to target. And in that sense, if you're actually using multiple measures, you've already sorted half of the problem. What we really do, when we want to measure something which can't be directly captured, such as identity, is that we will really ask loads of different questions. And all of those questions you know, will have different variants and different biases because they will all be different. And at the end, what we will be aiming for is this little heart there which is the common variance. In other words, well, let's talk about some of the, you know, some of the um, measures which uh, I use in my surveys. Again, whether they are right or wrong, we can discuss later. But um, one of the things I would ask people, for instance, is what reaction they would have if uh, somebody burnt a European flag in front of them. Now. Part of the people will tell me, you know, that they would be mad or that they would be happy or whatever because they feel I don't feel European. Part of the people will give me their answer because, you know, they think it's scandalous to burn any flag anyway. So, you know, there will be error in that question, definitely. And there will also be part of the answers which will be identity related. Um, I ask people about their reaction when they hear the European anthem. Again, there will be people who actually will tell me that uh, when they hear the European anthem, they cry or they feel proud. Because they feel European, there are others because they just love Beethoven and, you know, and they just think that it's a wonderful piece of music. Uh, or just because, you know, they always cry and feel moved whenever they hear any anthem because, you know, they see all these people crying and feeling moved themselves. Um, I've got a taste for asking people whether they ever cry for some reason in my surveys. And I just, I, I'm, I'm going to take you away from uh, European identity for a second and talk about that project of mine on uh, electoral psychology. Did any of you realize that... Uh, more than one in three Americans has already cried because of an election. I think it's a wonderful finding. Um, and, you know, I think that it tells us something about emotions in a way which, you know, we wouldn't just measure with some other forms of 
uh, of questions. But anyway, so, you know, you allowed me to say one thing which is really important, which is, um, so, you know, we use all these questions. Uh, what would be your reaction if uh, somebody burnt a European flag in front of you? Um, what do you feel about the fact that, um, uh, you know, on your passport it's written European Union, uh, German Federal Republic, and things like that? Well, you know, that's, again, something which will partly tell us about something else and partly tell us about what we want to figure out. But the assumption we make is that if we use enough questions and the error term in each of them is different, when we analyze all these questions together, when we index them, what we'll end up doing is getting rid of all the variance which is irrelevant because it will be associated with one question but not with the others. And what, people, and what makes people say both that they would be mad if somebody burnt a European flag and that they are moved when they hear the European anthem and that they are happy that uh, their passport says that it's a European Union passport and uh, that when there are several games, I'll talk to you about that in a second, uh, they always choose the European team. When, when they do all of that, then it probably means that they do it because they feel European. And that's really the whole point, if you want, of quantitative measurement. The difference between quantitative and qualitative approaches to measuring identities is that in quantitative, you don't look for the perfect measures. You look for the perfect uh, sum of measures, if you want, which have one thing in one particular uh, attribute, which is that their error term must be different. In other words, it doesn't matter if some of them are not perfect, it just matters that you've got enough of them and that you can actually pile them up together in such a way as, in such a way as to be able to exclude all the variants which you don't want to include in your measure because you know it's not related to European identity itself. That question about games, by the way, is really interesting, uh, I think. Um, it's one which I've had to abandon uh, in many ways, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I was asking people, I give people, uh, um, I told people, let's start from the beginning, um, in a few months, um, the international um, world, uh, sorry, the international women volleyball championship will take place. And a number of games are going to be played, and for each of those games, uh, I would like you to tell me which team you would like to win. And in each of the six games, you would have a random alternation of always one European team against one non-European team. Any type of European against any type of non-European. And obviously the point is to see whether people uh, choose the European team against the non-European team. Why did I choose uh, international women's volleyball, by the way? Sorry. Because it's unknown, exactly. I mean, you know, absolutely no offense if any of you are playing volleyball, but uh, if I had asked the question about, you know, the next Football World Cup, I would always have some, you know, geeks who tell me, oh, you know, I want Portugal uh, to win because I love Cristi Cristiano Ronaldo, or, you know, I really want England to lose because Rooney is a thug or whatever. I mean, it doesn't, that's not the sort of thing, I don't find that sort of, you know, intelligent comment uh, about why people want a specific team to win. I want to measure pure prejudice. And to measure pure prejudice, indeed, I need measures which are more or less uh, related to something which is unknown. In other words, how do people choose a team when they have absolutely no other information than uh, the nationality? And I couldn't use that question. I couldn't use it because over 90% of the people systematically chose the European team against the non-European team, which I found fascinating. By the way, um, when I say that, people are really surprised because they say, well, but, you know, precisely in football, uh, it doesn't work that way. I mean, people wouldn't really support, uh, you know, German, uh, Austrian people would probably never support Germany in football, I imagine. Uh, but that's exactly it. I mean, neighborly disputes in many ways are a natural part of, um, of identity formation itself. Uh, people from Manchester undoubtedly feel very Mancunian. I know enough of them to know that. But if you are a Manchester United supporter, the one team you would really want to lose every single time is Manchester City. Uh, and the reason for that is that, you know, there is that sort of neighborly rivalry which actually makes form of identity. But it doesn't contradict, in my view, the fact that when you actually enter a world which is not loaded with intimate rivalries, such as Manchester United versus City or Arsenal versus Chelsea or whatever else, um, then you actually get reactions which will betray to a certain extent uh, your feeling of relative proximity to a number of um, alternative 
um, political or human communities. Um, yeah, please. Sorry. Just one very short question. Is this necessarily a sign of more identification or simply more um, proximity in the sense of knowing this more? Because it seems to me that the fact that something is closer to you or more familiar to you doesn't necessarily mean that you identify with it more. It's just that in the case when you're confronted with something that you already know versus something that you don't know, for example, if you don't even know where Senegal is on the map, you will probably go for Germany. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you identify with Germany in any way. I would say, in principle, what you say makes perfect sense. The limit to it are uh, some of the actual games. So some games would be, for instance, uh, USA versus Slovakia. And when you ask that in a country like France or the UK, I would argue that probably people, if it's a case of knowing, uh, you know, in that case, they might actually know the non-European team uh, more than the other one. And in fact, uh, the only exception, because again, we, we rotated lots of different uh, countries and we had very large samples, the one country from outside of Europe, which was the biggest exception, uh, so the one where, which, you know, a number of people seem to choose for some reason was Fiji. So I would say that this sort of, you know, uh, contradicts. But again, uh, this being said, I think, uh, I think the idea made sense. Um, I think that knowledge might also have an impact. There is no, you know, again, in the same way that you need multiple measures uh, to actually capture any concept, including identity. Con similarly, any measure will always tap into several, um, several con concepts as well. In other words, a given measure might be um, affected both by identity and by knowledge and by a number of other things as well. Uh, once you go holiday, for instance, about Fiji. Yeah. Exactly this you can control for also. If you care, you can ask if the people know it, if they have been there, if they're mm. familiar with it, if they maybe even come from the country. So it's possible to control for it and then, you know, yeah, put this into your model so you can actually look at this question. That's just a possible. No, I think that's right. I mean, you, you can control, in a way, the way in which you control primarily uh, is by doing two different things. I mean, first of all, by, again, rotating the countries because uh, I think that, you know, if, if you always use the same countries, uh, you could have a whole number of things affecting your model. But when you, the more you rotate them, in a way, um, the more you can actually avoid that sort of bias. Um, the second, I mean, the limit, obviously, of controlling is uh, money, uh, in the sense that, you know, it does cost money to actually uh, ask uh, other questions. But again, the other way in which you do it is by superimposing uh, various questions. And again, the fact that even if part of it, let's, you know, take your, your argument at face value, even if part of it is indeed affected by knowledge, uh, that will probably disappear when you actually uh, index that particular measure with all the other ones. So again, you know, that, that's the, the important thing in a way, and, and I know it sounds very unfair when I say it that way, because uh, it's a way of saying, oh, well, you know, it's fine if I use imperfect measures uh, because I use less of them, and that doesn't mean that you shouldn't criticize the individual measures, because if some of them are really bad, then you know, they definitely should go. But it's still the case that, you know, in, in the way you actually want to think about a measurement model, and this time I'm really trying to be practical in case some of you are actually using um, quantitative measures, I think that you can never afford to only look at the individual variables. You always need to actually look at how many of them you are and how you index them. Um, the way I typically index my variables, um, I mean, there are several ways of indexing uh, different variables, by the way, and that partly depends on uh, what they are. Um, one way is to do simply what we would call a mean index. Now, mean index would be something, uh, meaning you, know, you sort of add all the variables and you sort of divide them by the number of answers you have. That's the sort of simplest way of doing it. Uh, Statistically equivalent, but conceptually different to a mean index is a summative index. It's exactly the same, except that you don't divide, you just add up. You would essentially do that when um, you think that the variance between different uh, components of your measure might not be related, but that's really your concept and those are your measures. That's the sort of model. So, example. Um, one of the things I do in my models is that I try to understand how European experience affects uh, the level of European identity of citizens. Now, to measure European experience, I ask a whole string of questions, including you know, whether people speak foreign languages, uh, whether they have already lived in another European country, whether they travel to other countries, things like that. Um, 
All these things individually are part of the extent to which we as individuals exper experience Europe, right? But I don't necessarily expect them to vary together as people, whether they have origin from any other European country, whether they are family living in another European country, and so on. I don't necessarily expect somebody who travels a lot, speaks many languages, to have necessarily lived in another European country. So, in a way, uh, the important, the interesting element here is not the common variance, but how many of those uh, ways of experimenting Europe have been, um, are relevant, if you want, to a given individual. So, in that case, I do what, uh, I do that summative index. And in a way, if you want, it means that the more of it you have, the more, the higher European experience would be. But in the case of these other variables, the ones I was telling you about, which that model, right, the one where we actually use a lot of variables expected to capture a common core, if you want, uh, then typically I use uh, factor analysis, which admittedly, I'll tell you from the start, is, uh, is a wrong way of using factor analysis in principle. I mean, in, you know, in, technically, in psychometric terms, factor analysis is actually an, expl an explanatory uh, technique, which is meant to actually... I mean, the idea is that basically you've got a latent factor which typically explains a number of things and you can't really measure those things directly, so you actually use factor analysis to approximate that latent factor. That's the sort of, you know, uh, technical way in which factor analysis has been designed and what it's meant to do. Now, with that proviso, um, I actually use factor analysis in a way which many people actually use it. In fact, most people use it nowadays, including, I would argue, in uh, social psychology, which is as a pseudo measurement model. And what you do really is that you make it work the other way around. You actually say, well, you know, whatever is the common variance between those, um, you know, between those uh, variables is the latent factor, is that variable which I'm trying to measure, because I'm not actually using variables which are effectively uh, intended to be explained by something else, but which are supposed to be measures of that something else. Again, uh, that's not the proper way of doing it if you are a methodological purist. It's still the dominant way of doing it, and it has one very big advantage, which is that if you are actually within a conceptual model where uh, you are effectively uh, able to claim, rightly or wrongly, that your measures are measures of a concept, then the latent factor, uh, well, the factor solution, if you want, to your factor analysis, will logically be the latent variable which you are trying to measure. I mean, that's the way it would actually be constructed, if you want, by um, co corroborating, if you want, uh, common variance. Now, uh, this is what I use is actually called uh, exploratory factor analysis, but I actually use it as a confirmatory form of exploratory factor analysis. You could ask then, why don't you use confirmatory factor analysis? Confirmatory factor analysis is something a bit different, whereby you actually have... You actually have multiple such, uh, multiple such um, elements, and then you have measures of each of them and causal links between them. Uh, the problem with confirmatory factor analysis, the reason why I don't use it, is that uh, confirmatory factor analysis is an inductive technique an iterative technique, if you want to actually be sort of specific about it, which effectively uh, merges together the measurement component and, um, and the model component of your research. In other words, um, by iterations, you will ascribe value to all the latent variables within the model to maximize the fit both of how each latent variable is measured and how they actually explain each other. 
And that is really problematic because uh, the problem with any form of iterative technique is that it becomes very unrobust. Um, in other words, you remember what I said about the whole point of my using exploratory factor analysis is that exploratory factor analysis is a fierce technique. It will get rid of all the variance which is not really shared between uh, various of my measurement items. Confirmatory factor analysis doesn't do that precisely because it is an iterative technique. It will end up being uh, potentially very highly affected by any form of error you introduce in the model. In other words, uh, if you want to put it in sort of uh, ways which flatter my modesty, uh, I don't explore, uh, I don't use confirmatory factor analysis because I don't trust my measurement items sufficient, sufficiently. I don't think they're actually pure measures. And therefore, using confirmatory factor analysis would be giving too much credit, if you want, to the variables that I use. Parenthesis on factor analysis, which I can go on forever if some of you are interested in factor analysis, but otherwise we might be better off moving, moving on. Any other question at this stage or comment or idea or, yeah. Um, no, I mean, the, the way I do it uh, is that, I mean, okay, then let, let's start with the measurement itself. So, um, now, when you want to measure something, uh, again, as I mentioned, there are two different approaches to measuring identities. Uh, the first one is that you ask about it, and the second one is that you try to trap, if you want, people into betraying, in a way, their identity. And again, for a number of reasons, I think that both are important and that, you know, uh, we need both the sort of direct questions, uh, like, you know, does it mean anything to you to be a European citizen, for instance, and the sort of trapping question like the ones about um, how people would choose uh, a team in a virtual uh, volleyball game or, you know, the sort of uh, questions about their reaction when somebody burns a, a new flag and so on. Um, the way I do it is that I sort of divided conceptually identity into three different types of components, if you want. The one separate from the others is a sort of spontaneous component, which is precisely the sort of expressive value of identity, if you want. In other words, when you ask people directly about their identity, do they say that they feel European? The other two are equivalent to those sort of trapping measures, if you want, and I call them civic and cultural. Now, it's a bit of a complicated uh, argument to make because uh, in much of the sociological and anthropological literature on identities, traditional historical uh, literature, um, there is a distinguer which is operated between um, civic and cultural or civic and ethnic, or civic, I mean, there are a number of different values or wordings used for the, what I call the cultural, but those are actually different from mine. I mean, in those models, what they do is that they ask people, why do you feel close to people from your community? And they distinguish between um, perceptions of a common culture. Uh, I feel close to them because we share the same religion, or because we share the same ethnicity, or because we share the same language, or because we share... Uh, common history, whatever, you know, sort of myth of uh, nationalism. And the civic one would be, you know, I feel close to them because we share common values or we actually uh, have the same way of thinking about things or we even we have the same enemies. Um, that's a sort of, you know, derivative of Habermasian theories of, uh, of identity. This is not really the way I do it. Uh, the way I differentiate between the two, the reason why I actually use my on um, uh, take on those labels is because I actually define civic, civic component of identity as uh, a feeling of relevance of my European citizenship. In other words, identification with uh, a political system and cultural identity as a feeling of relative closeness to the members of a human community, if you want. So in other words, what is typically considered as the two pillars of identity in much of the anthropological and sociological research, the civic and uh, ethnic components, are both captured in a way by my, by my culture, they're both part of the cultural component ident of identity, and the civic component would be actually something quite different, because again, it sort of assumes that there can be identification with a political system and not just with human beings. So that's the sort of you know, weird... Uh, weirdness in the model. So in any way, 
Um, when I do that, uh, then no, I actually try to use variables which are different, and I try to actually use them in uh, in ways that make them belong together in a number of ways. Sorry, so uh, I do the so the spontaneous identity, which is sort of expressive, the civic, which is that identification with the political. Uh, system, the cultural, which is feeling closer to fellow Europeans than to non-European, and then separately again, I measure um, support for EU citizenship, which is again a different thing, uh, and that's the sort of thing where I actually look at the adhesion of uh, various people to a number of uh, things, such as, uh, you know, both existing attributes of EU citizenship, like free circulation of people, the right to vote in local elections for EU citizens, and some possible um, future evolutions, like, you know, would people in France or Germany uh, be favorable to uh, Romanian citizens being able to vote in national elections, as well as local ones? Um, or somebody yesterday was mentioning the question of, you know, um, one person, one vote, I can't remember who it was. Um, Thank you. So, you know, in that sense, one of the questions I have is, you know, what if when there is a new treaty, instead of having, um, you know, a sort of federal type um, approval system, which is that, you know, every state ratifies individually, we had a new wide referendum, which means that implicitly, indeed, the people from Luxembourg, if you actually think in terms of uh, national votes, would have a very low say um, in the approval, while the people in Germany would have a much bigger one. So, you know, that's the sort of questions which I use. Why do I measure support for EU citizenship separately? Um, first of all, because it's interesting, I think. Uh, but secondly, as well, because support for EU citizenship is explicitly not an identity, but an attitude. And therefore, uh, it allows me to check whether what I measure as supposedly measures of identity are indeed more robust and more uh, stronger, if you want, than measures of an attitude in a very directly related field. In other words, if I find that European identity, what I call European identity, is as volatile as measures of citizenship, then that would sort of prove that my measures are wrong that they're really not identity measures because we expect identity to be stronger and more robust than attitudes. If I find that measures of the attitudes are actually more volatile than measures of identity, then there is a good chance that I'm actually tapping into something stronger. It might or might not be identity. I would argue that it is, but some of you will disagree, and that's perfectly fine. But at least it will be different if you want. Uh, from the simple EU citizenship attitude, because I'm precisely measuring them independently and separately. Now, um, so within that context, I measure these things independently. Um, I try to make sure that the questions are different, um, that they represent different levels of hardness, if you want, uh, of identity. In other words, some of them I expect many people to subscribe to, other ones would expect uh, much fewer people to subscribe to. They're actually phrased in different ways. So for some of them, uh, acquiescence would play in a pro-identity direction. For others, acquiescence would play in an anti-acquiescence, uh, in an anti-identity uh, direction. And then I try to make sure that they actually tap into different uh, aspects of each of my components of identity and that the error term in each of them will not overlap too much. Because again, what I don't want to do is to uh, bias my measures by having different measures which all have the same error term. But on that basis, I don't hierarchize between them because that's what factor analysis does for me. In other words, factor analysis will tell you that, um, you know, basically, you've got this, say, five measures, and it will tell you that measures A, B, C, D actually work quite well and that measure E is an outlier. And then when you find that, oops, sorry. Um, and then, um, I don't see... Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I think that next one, I'll just change the sheet. That will be a bit easier. But, uh, so, you know, that's the, um, uh, then when that happens, uh, you have to ask yourself, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who believes in a persistent schizophrenic dialogue between empirics and uh, theory, if you want. I like to do that 
empirically because it will give me a result. Then I look at the result, and if I find that sort of question, then I go back to my theory and say, well, was it in fact the case that this measure E, which seems like an outlier, is not a very good measure of identity? Can I actually make an analytical argument to say that it should actually not work with the rest? Or is it the case that there is something wrong with my model, in which case I can play around? Um, just to give you a sense, I um, actually have, um, uh, in the um, uh, in the mass study, the, the recent one, the sort of, you know, 27 countries, 30-something uh, thousand respondents and everything, um, we first piloted uh, nearly 40 different measures of identity, most of which have not been asked in any survey, to actually see how they behave. And then we actually did um, some qualitative pilots and focus group about the measures with all of our, well, not all, but a sample of our respondents from different countries, to see how people perceive these questions, you know, what they think they were telling us when they ask them. So in other words, we make them talk about the survey uh, before we actually take it to the next stage and actually ask those you know, thousands and thousands of people to be able to hopefully exclude uh, some variables, which I might have thought would be good measures, but ended up being understood in a very different way. Uh, what, incidentally, your barometer didn't do with the question, which I told you about. Otherwise, they would have found that people didn't really like that question or didn't really feel that it said uh, what your barometer thinks it says. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I do understand that there's a lot of problems with the, especially the Moreno question of the Eurobarometer, mm -hmm. and that the Eurobarometer also does not pilot enough for their questions. But uh, they do have at least tried in recent years to change the questions a bit. So could you give some, th some information on what you think about the new identity questions in the Eurobarometer? Well, there have, there have been several of them, so it's difficult to actually comment upon all of them. But let's say that they have all have, I think that in general, many of them are better than the Moreno question. But the main problem I have with them is that all of them, um, again, do the thing I was sort of criticizing at the beginning, which is if I want to know if people feel European, let me just ask them. And I think that, again, that simply, as a, as a social scientist who uses a lot of survey myself, I'm just very conscious, and you know, maybe too conscious, you could argue that, but you know, it, it's a very, um, I, you know, it, it's something that is a real part of me as an academic, um, that we have a tendency as social scientists very often to go to people who don't really want to see us, who don't really want to speak to us, uh, and go there with our own uh, toolbox. And we use our own words, and we expect that when we actually go there, it's a bit like you know having a nuclear physicist or uh, you know coming to you and starting to talk to, you, talk to you about things, asking you questions, and taking your answers at face value. I mean, it is threatening in the sort of social psychological sense of the term because we end up using variables, categories, concepts, words, which people either are not used to hearing or used to hearing in a very different way, or which are very connoted, very normatively connoted sometimes. So again, you know, I go back to my example of xenophobia and racism, when I've done loads of work on that, and that's one of the other areas of my work which really interests me. Uh, I might say that I'm going to, I really want to understand whether people are xenophobic, racist, anti-Semitic, um, and I'm not judging them, you know, I'm just doing it for science. But I can't negate the fact that for people, this is very heavily connoted. In fact, for me as well, it's very heavily connoted. I might not care when actually, you know, I just pinch my nose when I interview some extreme right leader who tells me that, you know, Jews and Negroes descend from the primate without having gone through the stages of human evolution. I'll pretend to smile on that I don't mind, but I do mind. I do care. I think it's horrible. And in many ways, I can't blame people for thinking it will sound horrible as well. Identity is less threatening in some ways, but it's still something which has a meaning. Let's take an example the UK. If I go and ask people, do you feel European in the UK, immediately the question is politicized, to go back to some of the discussion we had yesterday. I, I can tell people, to me, you can actually feel European and not support European integration. It's fine, but that's not the way to hear it. They think immediately, that guy wants to know whether I want the UK to leave the EU or not. That's what they are going to hear. And as social scientists, if we don't make the effort of trying to figure out how people are going to hear the question that we ask, then we are doing something very wrong. And I think that, unfortunately, with identity, 
and quantitative measurements of identity, this is a particularly significant problem. And therefore, uh, I think that, you know, again, uh, I'm certainly not arguing that my solutions are perfect solutions, maybe not even good solutions, but at least, you know, uh, they try to avoid some of those uh, issues for some of them. And, yeah, I, I just think that, you know, that, that would be my reservation, if you want, even with the uh, more recent Eurobarometer questions, which, again, are definitely better than the Moreno question, relax a number of assumptions uh, that the Moreno question used to make, but are still very much taking identity at face value. And I think that, you know, um, I don't know, I guess I believe more in subconscious layers of identity than uh, people just being able to tell. You know, it's very simple. Let's imagine that you interviewed me and asked me to talk about myself and who I am and what matters. I would make you lists of answers. I would tell you maybe about my country, about the fact that my eight great-grandparents came from eight different countries, about the fact that I've lived in different countries. But I might spend the entire hour and a half of a narrative interview without telling you I'm a man. It doesn't mean that my gender doesn't have any effect on the way I identify and the way I see life. It probably does, but it just means that, in a way, uh, there are aspects of our identity which are so obvious to us because we live with them on a daily basis that we would not necessarily be able to express them as analytical categories, however hard we tried, however honestly we tried. And therefore, um, you know, we, we have to try and be one step ahead of the game, I guess, when we, uh, when we measure things. In qualitative, I think it's a problem, but in a way, um, people usually have enough time to correct part of it. In other words, because you make people speak a lot, um, then you know, part of it can be corrected. Uh, in quantitative, it's much harder because questions are expensive. We can't ask as many as we want. Uh, and mostly, if we do it wrong, we can't go back. Uh, you know, I've, one of the things I always tell my PhD students is you know, some of them actually um, have the chance, you know, have had the luck of getting some small grants to do surveys and things like that. Uh, but even when they do interviews, it's exactly the same. I say, well, you know, just you really need to think about it before. And because the one thing you can't do, you can't conduct 20 interviews and then go back to people and say, oh, shit, you know, I forgot to ask you that. Would you mind answering me again? It doesn't work that way. And in surveys, even less so, because uh, in an interview context, you just embarrass yourself. Uh, in a survey context, you just can't do it because you don't have any money left. So I think that, you know, in a way, uh, that's the crux uh, of what is so hard about measuring identity quantitatively, because in a way, uh, we need to ask people about their identity using, in my view, a number of operational variables which don't talk about identity. Uh, because if we do, either they won't answer. That's another thing, by the way, which is important. Do you know that when you read most surveys, um, for 100 people who have been attempted interviewees, about 15 will have answered. So 85 of the 100 will have just refused to answer anyway. And you can't just assume that you know, this is a random, um, you know, a random loss. We've tried to construct questionnaires in very different ways, to present them in a different ways, to create incentives in different ways, and we have response rates of about 70%. I would argue that this makes a real difference, uh, because I think that you know, the fact that a majority of people answer my surveys, our surveys, uh, that's on the project, so I'm going to do it on my own, and I have the pleasure of doing it with colleagues. Um, I think you also get a different, you know, quality of answers to a certain extent. So, you know, either people won't answer, or they will answer something very different, because immediately when they are confronted with an interviewer, uh, they wonder what you're after. You know, what are you trying to figure out? What you, you know, you, you can't, you can't prevent it. It's natural. I mean, if somebody came to me on the street. Uh, for a face-to-face -face survey and ask me, would you mind answering a few questions? Immediately part of me would be, and not just because I'm an academic and I do survey, but immediately part of me would be wondering, you know, who's this guy? What are they after? What are they trying to figure out? What are they going to make with the result? I mean, we can't pretend that we don't exist. We have a role in, you know, in, we are perceived in a certain way by the people we speak to. So that was a longish digression on, uh, you know, on surveys and and trying to put yourself in the shoes on, of your respondents rather than uh, the shoes of the researcher. <laughs>
I mean, I, I had that example with one of my um, master students actually last week. She does something on um, very interesting on what uh, why some um, people of uh, Muslim background vote for the extreme right uh, in France and the UK. And you know, she one of the questions she was asking people in her focus groups was, uh, you know, um, do you vote for the National Front or the BNP uh, because of their stance on the Muslim cause? I was, like, completely horrified by the use of the word Muslim cause because, you know, when you, it, made, it made perfect sense to her. But when you start using those categories when you speak to people, you immediately sort of uh, start a number of, of alarm bells, if you want, uh, in their mind, which are going to affect uh, the, way they, uh, the way they do things. More comments? Yep. Uh -huh. I'm glad I'm not the only one who would forget if I didn't have it under my, <laughs> my chin. Yeah, because in a way you, you keep the idea that there is a good way to ask a question of identity and that identity is something like a we are viable and we should find the, either the right way to ask a question or a way to solve that is the common variance between many questions, but which is also a way to define identity that, I mean, maybe I would say, oh, I'm European, but I don't care if uh, someone burn a flag and someone will say it, it, uh, it matters for him. Okay, so is it, do we need to really to find a common variance or is it just that there are different uh, definition of, uh, of European identity and so that there is something which could be pointless, pointless of trying to find a we are variable, which would be identity like and a variable which would look like weight, that, so something which is really uh, on a scale or very clearly. So we are quantitative variables. And so my other uh, impression is that finally it doesn't really, uh, why, why does it matter? So why does it really uh, make us able to prove something different on a theoretical level, do we find something which is really different with those different questions? And in a way, would would also show that, okay, the first was really wrong or false because it, um, it led us to bad theory and the other uh, way to measure things prove us something which is, I don't know, a better theory or better way to predict some empirical uh, result or outcomes. I think that, I mean, that's, you know, one or two very good questions. Uh, in, because in a way, it's, like, it's the first question which has consequences on another. Uh, I think there is a big sort of theoretical question behind your question, which is, uh, can we define Europeanness or European identity in a way which would be common, if you want, to people? I mean, can we define a sort of prototype of European identity which people would either subscribe to or not. I mean, I think that that's one of the key questions here. Well, there, um, I mean, I think that's one of the, uh, you know, one of the big uh, recurrent fights between sociologists and, and uh, social psychologists on identity. I mean, they tend to very often disagree and political scientists are sort of stuck in the middle somewhere, uh, but we're not many, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and the reason is that, in a way, uh, there is still a large proportion of the sociology literature which uh, has been enriched by more holistic perceptions on identity. And the notion that, you know, identity means something and means something common, I guess, to many people. While social psychologists have been enriched by uh, the channels, if you want, of uh, methodological individualism and therefore the perception that um, if out of the 20-something of us, 18 say that we all feel European, uh, we might all mean something completely different. From that perspective, I guess I'm closer to the sort of uh, methodological individualism perception, if you want. In other words, I think that even though we might find some common patterns, um, I think that ultimately identities are very individual in the way they are expressed. And I think that they are very individual in the way they actually act in people's lives simply because they are also tested, if you want, uh, by every, our everyday practice of the world around us. And from that point of view, um, 
this is probably the reason why I don't think that there is a perfect measure that we could find, even if we tried really hard. Um, I think that, again, one of the reasons is that people don't really realize their identity fully, because much of it is, in my view, by definition, buried, uh, subconscious. And secondly, it could mean so many different things. And I, I think um, one of you yesterday as well said, you know, it's all interesting, all these questions about whether people feel European or not, but um, it seems that fewer people ask about what Europeanness means to people. Uh, again, I can't remember which of you it was, but uh, somebody mentioned it anyway. Um, and, and I think that's absolutely true. And in many ways, I mean, many of the questions which I ask are there to actually try and understand what people actually mean when they just say that they feel European. And again, one of the really interesting things here is that uh, when we do that, when we actually try and understand, you know, what does it mean to you to be a citizen of the European Union, for instance, um, or what words uh, do you associate with the European flag or with the words European Union or with the word European, simply. Um, we've got all these variations in, in different ways. Uh, the results we get are actually quite interesting. Because when you listen to the political debate, uh, when you look at the sort of top-down discussion of uh, the European Union, um, what you get is that typically people who are pro-European say that the European Union is uh, what makes us stronger, what has guaranteed peace in Europe for about 60, 70 years now, nearly, um, you know, what is making us able to compete. Uh, on the global uh, economic scene and everything. And then you get the people who are against Europe who say, well, you know, the European Union is really a massive bureaucratic machine, technocrats making decisions which have an effect on everybody else's life and everything. When you actually ask people for associations with either an EU flag or the word European, or when you ask them about what it means to them to be a citizen of the European Union, uh, the references you get are actually very different. You don't have that many people referring to bureaucracy. You don't have that many people referring to peace either uh, or to economic prosperity. What you really get is people refer to how the European Union changes their everyday life. And when you ask them what it means to them to be European, the two top answers are being able to cross borders without having to show my passport and having euros in my back pocket. That's what people actually get if you want from being European. And the more you go to the younger generation, you add things like being able to live wherever I want in the European Union. So, you know, it's really about um, a number of rights, of attributes, which are given to us, if you want, by EU citizenship, and which part of us knows were not there before, or would not be there without the European Union. Um, and in order to be able to do that, but to also, and then you have served the, the sort of perceptions of the European Union as uh, a political system, and then you get these references to strength and unity, which, to be honest, are simply not there in the political discourse. Um, and the interesting thing, by the way, there is that um, while uh, Sarah Harrison and myself have been doing quite a lot of work on quantitative measures of European identity, we've also worked with some colleagues from other countries about how the European Union is perceived by others. And so the same question we have about what are the first three words that come to your mind when you see this flag, the EU flag. Uh, we also asked in a number of countries in Asia, the Pacific, and we're able to sort of uh, cross-check, if you want, uh, the differences between the projected image of the European Union abroad in the rest of the world and the projected image of the European Union seen by some citizens. So the only way in which you can do that, the only way in, you, in which you can actually open that door is by not taking too prescriptive a perception of what Europeanness actually means. So those are the two options. I mean, either you, you sort of think that there is, that identity actually means something, and then we should really aim for it, or you actually go uh, for those multiple measures, which do not only allow you to sort of look at common variants, but also allows you to sort of capture to some extent how European identity might mean different things to different people. Now, does it help, or does it actually make any difference, uh, the sort of, you know, so what measure? Well, I would argue that it does, in the sense that, again, um, with using those measures of identities, when you do use identity in a number of complex models, um, you do highlight a number of links uh, 
which are not completely obvious when you actually go for self-expressed uh, measures of identity. Uh, and again, I'm looking at links with conceptions of democracy, for instance, links with efficacy, links with uh, representation ideals, if you want to call them that way, uh, links with xenophobia, uh, extremism, links with cynicism. Um, all these things are actually related to European identity, uh, but you can only get that when you actually look at those various components of identity and when you look at it using different measures. If you only use the self-expressed measures, or for that matter, if you only use support for integration, then there are a number of things which you cannot explain within more complex causal models, which you can do when you actually look at the dimensionality of identity and the way in which it could actually take different meanings as well uh, to different people. I mean, that would be my argument. But again, uh, I'm also very conscious of the uh, you know, the price of that argument, which is that, you know, we don't have a simple measure. Uh, and, and very often that's what people ask me as well. You know, and they know I've done all the surveys. They say, well, you know, I've only got money to ask one question about European identity. What should I ask? That's a perfectly fair question. I mean, you know, when you think about how difficult it is to get money, um, and, you know, when they ask for that, then usually I can give them a sort of, a uh, little series of two or three questions which capture identity in a way which I think is sort of decent. Uh, but again, I would actually vary my answer in part depending on how they actually want to use it. Um, in other words, uh, whether they do want to use it in a causal model or not, whether they want to approximate European identity, because sometimes um, in a complicated way, a less good measure can be a better proxy for the real measure in causal models. I know it sounds very obscure when I say it that way, uh, but sometimes you can have a purer measure of identity if I give you, like, you know, two or three measures which work really well together, uh, and, um, you know, and at the same time, the error that is introduced by limiting to those two or three impedes the value of, those me of the created measure when you want to use it in uh, complex causal models. Nothing is ever simple in the social sciences, I'm afraid. I mean, that's the sort of, you know, a reality we have to live with uh, in many ways. And, and again, the whole question is, uh, why do you think European identity matters? I mean, again, uh, if you think that it's just interesting in itself, and we want to know whether people feel European or not, it's one particular set of questions, European identity matters and we want to understand what they mean by it, then it will be a slightly different set of questions. And European identity matters because it will have an impact on what type of Eurosceptic you are or whether or not you would want your country to leave the European Union or whether you would want, um, you know, uh, whether or not you are favorable to a federal Europe or whether or not uh, you feel like promoting a new different concept of democracy uh, in the Western world and think that parliamentary democracy has, uh, has added by now and should be replaced then again, that would be a different set of questions. And all these things are potentially interesting because again, uh, even though I'm really interested in European identity as an object, I'm also very conscious that um, in a way, the implications of identity are important. We know it. I mean, we know that for one thing, uh, it's important for the European Union per se. Uh, the European Union is not a baby anymore. Uh, and in that sense, uh, it has reached the age when it needs some level of legitimacy. It can't just claim on uh, the fact that it's a new thing being built or that it's good for the people to be uh, legitimate. I'm, you know, I'm anticipating a bit on, on the panel discussion tonight, but I think that you know, from that point of view, um, knowing whether or not people feel European and whether or not they identify with the European Union, which are different things, but also very important, um, those things are actually you know, potentially very meaningful when we actually look at the legitimacy of the whole democratic system of, or non-fully democratic system of the EU, I guess. Anything more? Yep. Um, I have, this is a, a more technical question, and I'm happy to ask it to you separately if you don't think it's of general interest to, to the group here. Mm -hmm. But um, when you talk about indexing variables, I know that these measures that you're using have different scales, some of them, which, which football team do you want, or, no, sorry, yeah. volleyball team do you want to win, and then others burning the flag, you know, the scale of four or five. Um, 
when you do an additive injection or more or an injection procedure, I mean, what impact does it have on these different scale sizes? Mm -hmm. um, and then related to that, when you wind up with these indexes at the end, um, you talked about the, um, the sort of spontaneous uh, expression of identity, the civic, and the, the cultural components. Do you then sort of combine those into a single identity variable at the end that you use in your analysis, or do you use these different indexes to measure different sort of outcomes? Okay. Um, well, I mean, the different scale, I mean, first of all, uh, there is a trap, which is that there are even more scales than what you can see actually in the question is, because uh, I'm a big fan of measurement experiments. And one of the things I'm really interested in is how the measurement we use affects uh, the type of distributions we get and therefore the type of, you know, conclusions we draw from things. I'll give you a very uh, simple example. Now, um, let's say that, you know, um, you want to know, I don't know, um, the extent to which, well, let's, let's take even one of the uh, one of the most direct, like this, one of the spontaneous questions. Like, you know, um, do you feel European? On the whole, do you feel European? Or on the scale from zero to X, do you feel European? These are sort of very basic things. Well, whether you give a, a not numbered scale with a middle point or an even numbered scale with no middle point, you are going to actually get results which are actually very different because in the second case, you're forcing people to take sides. While in the first case, you sort of allow them to be in the middle of the road and to sort of, you know, disguise uncertainty about the answer, uh, or for that matter, about the question, um, as, as a form of middle point. Now, every way in which we ask uh, those sort of questions will have an impact on the measurement we get. But... Either you can keep, choose one side, I mean, either do the even scale or do the odd scale. Or you can actually try and do both using speed samples, and that will allow you to actually sort of create a virtual measurement whether the effect of odd numbered and even numbered scales would be cancelled out if you want. And most of the time, in many of the questions uh, we have in the, in the 30 something thousand um, people survey, are questions for which we had some sort of measurement experiment. So split samples, which other that, or for some of them it would be, in one case, uh, you phrase uh, something only negative, in another case only positive. Um, so if you want, um, you know, all these things indeed have an impact, but the fact that you sort of alternate them in different questions means that they will end up cancelling themselves out. About the scale themselves, I mean, the differences in scales, uh, if you were doing a summative index or a mean index, um, the way you would do it would be by simply standard, standardizing the scales, and then you would actually get you know, something which would not be too affected um, by the different scales that you're using. But because I'm typically using factor analysis, uh, then the scales are naturally erased, if you want, uh, in the sense that, by definition, the factor analysis actually um, simply looks at variance and therefore equal, equalizes variance before it even starts. So from that point of view, as long as you know what your scale is so that you read your results correctly, uh, it doesn't really have an impact on, on the index. But again, the, the proviso to that, the, the one thing which does really uh, make a difference, or the two things which really make a difference, are um, more to do with the way in which people answer and are, again, is there a middle point or not, because that has an impact uh, on distributions. Um, and secondly, uh, how do you play uh, your hand in terms of acquiescence? Um, again, acquiescence, I don't know if all of you are familiar with it, is the notion that, you know, typically, uh, without realizing it, or sometimes we real, while realizing it, when we ask people some questions, uh, part of them is really nice and try to please us. And uh, in a way, it means that people are much more likely at equal statements to tell you that they agree with something than they disagree with it. So if you want to um, if you want to bias results voluntarily, for instance, you would always make sure that what you want to show corresponds to the agree end of the scale. 
if you don't want to bias your results, then what you do is that you do precisely um, split samples and or measurement experiments to make sure that uh, the term which is being agreed with uh, doesn't always play in the same direction. So sometimes agreeing means that you don't feel European and sometimes agreeing means that you feel European, that way you sort of cancel out the, um, you cancel out the uh, acquiescence effect. Okay, where do we take it from here? Um, we sort of digressed a bit, which is good. Um, and again, please do feel free to, to jump in uh, at any time. Um, one of the big questions which uh, are being raised uh, at this stage, or which we should raise at this stage, are precisely um, the relationship, if you want, between um, European identity and other identities if we don't actually assume them to be in a natural tension. Uh, because again, now we are sort of uh, facing a potential dilemma whereby either people could really feel, say, European and Dutch and Catalan and Berliner, or a case whereby uh, the two are effectively in tension, but that tension is not being captured by the questions that we have. Because again, if we do ask the questions separately, if we ask people, um, you know, on a scale from zero to seven, where zero means that you don't feel European at all, and seven means that you feel extremely European, and then you know, on a scale from zero to seven, where zero means that you don't feel um, French at all, and ten means that you feel extremely French. That it will work. Does it work? Anybody complaining? So. Um, so, yeah, so the, the fact that we do it that way, um, you know, raises the question of how uh, European and non-European identities uh, sort of work together. I mean, from that point of view, um, I want, that's why I actually ask you to also read um, the work which I find quite interesting of, of Thomas Risse on that, uh, because it's just as a model which people usually like, and they like it because it's very graphic. Uh, it's this model of Russian dolls and lay a cake, and in different ways. That's also the reason why I ask you to read Sophie's work, because I think that it, it does tell us a lot about it as well. Um, it tells us about the way in which uh, European and sub-European identities sort of interact with each other. In other words, uh, the Russian doll model, that one, which we say is, say is, is not there, it's not the real world would be a model whereby identities would be contained within each other. So we would feel first, uh, I don't know, uh, hamburger, then, you know, uh, German, then European, and all those identities would be sort of contained within each other in concentric circles. The alternative model, the model, cake model, is the one whereby instead all those identities actually interact with each other and influence each other. And in other words, um, and again, uh, that Sophie's work on that, or also with the minus work on that, do tell us things about it, uh, are models whereby, in a way, if there is anything European about us, it would modify the way in which we think of our national identity, for instance. Or for that matter, in the number of regions, uh, the way we might feel about our Catalan or Scottish identities as well. I find those models much more interesting because I find them much more realistic as well. I think that the notion, uh, and you know, uh, time for uh, a mea culpa here, I must admit that originally um, I didn't really consider the marble cake model. I mean, spontaneously I thought, you know, all those identities are probably just all concentric, that will make sense. It took me some time to, you know, uh, I mean, but it was very intuitively convincing. Um, when I got exposed to it, that notion that indeed, I mean, it makes sense that identity should also uh, affect the way in which we um, define all the layers of our identity. In other words, for instance, uh, you know, the fact that somebody might feel Parisian, for instance, which I'm not, will probably also affect their perception of Frenchness. Um, and in that sense, you know, you would have these sort of mutual implications 
of all the different aspects of our identity, which are not naturally disentangled when, in the way we actually think about ourselves, but will end up virtually enriching each other and talking to each other. So that's you know, the first uh, point to raise about that notion of the relationship between European and sub-European identities. So again, if we measure them separately, clear positive correlation, the more you feel one, the more you think the others. But if the marble cake model is indeed the truth, and if all those identities uh, really affect each other, what does it really mean? I mean, in a way, the relationship between those identities might be falsely correlated, either underestimated or overestimated, by the very fact that we sort of rationalize, if you want, our different identity discourses to make them compatible with each other. So it could be the case that, in fact, the correlation is even stronger uh, because progressively we actually find ways of making things um, you know, coexist more harmoniously. Or it could be, on the contrary, the fact that there is a real tension which is simply not apparent because people are alterating, if you want, their identity discourses to sort of erase those tensions, which are really there, as you mentioned, you know, as a possibility, as a hypothesis, are really there, but uh, end up sort of disappearing behind um, language, linguistic mutations. Related to it, in my view, is the question of how um, identity is defined by your position of to an outgroup, right, or several outgroups. Now, that's the other big question which has an effect on the coexistence between European and sub-European identities. Because in many ways, uh, the other reason why many people assume that European and national identities should be contradictory, should be in tension, is because for many national identities, uh, the narrative of outgroup definition was almost always located within Europe, right? I mean, if you were French, the traditional enemy was probably the Germans, whether we want it or not. And in that way, it sounds like a paradox that people could actually embrace a European identity that includes Franco-German friendship at its heart, at the same time as it embraces a traditional French national identity. So what's the connection there between uh, the identity and the outgroup? Well, there I would send you, it's so weird, isn't it? I mean, I'm here to talk to you about uh, quantitative measures and I always end up referring to the qualitative ones as well, because I think that in many ways, uh, you know, they, they are actually very highlighting um, of a number of tensions and uh, contradictions that we actually need uh, to bear in mind when we conceive our quantitative models. Um, the work I'm referring to here is the wor work of uh, Ruth Wodak um, on Austrian identity. Now, uh, Ruth is a critical discourse analyst, one of the most famous ones at that. Um, and she's done a lot of work on uh, Austrian identity, which I find really interesting. And what I find really interesting here, uh, in particular, is the way in which she sort of highlighted the role of art groups in the definition of, um, of identity feelings. In particular, uh, so again, critical discourse analyst, so she does uh, things qualitatively in her case. Uh, she says the problem with Austria is that there is no natural basis of an Austrian identity. If you look at history, history was essentially Austro-Hungarian. Uh, if you look at language, obviously it's German. Uh, if you look at culture or crowd references, they would be essentially Viennese. There is really nothing which makes Austria as a sort of historical um, community, if you want. And therefore, people lost uh, in these sort of discrepancies between uh, references which are either too big, like Austro-Hungarian, or too small, like Viennese, and not only too small, but probably alienating for much of Austria, which is essentially a rural country, um, the only way in which the Austrians managed to create a sense of belonging, a sort of Austrian identity by default, was 
in reference to an art group. And she argues, rightly or wrongly, that this is the reason why um, extremist behavior and racism and xenophobia are higher in Austria than they are in many other European countries, despite Austria being essentially uh, a country which has never really known any major economic crisis for the past um, 60 years, is sort of socially stable, fairly well integrated and everything. So, you know, she says, well, it's not really the typical case where you would expect a high level of extreme right voting, for instance, but the success of the FPA uh, in Austria and the way it's actually uh, talked about by the people is essentially because, in a way, uh, they have a particular reliance on who we are not uh, to define their Austrianness. Now, conversely, in a more quantitative way, you could uh, look at the work this time of a social psychologist called Human Die. And she actually looked at the role of art groups in the emergence of a European identity this time. Um, and the work is again really interesting because she says that um, it is paradoxical that European identity has emerged in a way without reference to a clear or common art group. Now, this is quite interesting. I mean, it is sort of institutionally uh, written in because, in many ways, um, the European Union has been built as an empire, if you want, in the sense that uh, it was never constrained by natural geographical borders or those natural geographical borders well, went well beyond uh, the actual shape of the European communities um, in the 1950s. In other words, at the very least, the European Union has always had the vocation to become European, uh, and therefore, it's very difficult to actually oppose yourself to an art group when you know that your direct neighbors are really part of your ideal territorial extension, really. The second reason is that, obviously, the European Union has built uh, much of its uh, common identity mythology on the concept of peace. Uh, the whole idea was to say that the European Union was the road to never again, and therefore, in many ways, you sort of, when you do that, you sort of exclude the possibility from opposing yourself to some other groups in one of the traditional ways in which uh, the French or the Germans or the Brits or the Russians or the Turks or whoever you want um, ended up building mythological art groups uh, for, well, essentially uh, aggressive purposes. Uh, throughout their history, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries. So in that context, the European Union was not within its natural territory and therefore its neighbors couldn't really be a natural art group. And secondly, was defining itself as the end of art groups, if you want, and therefore couldn't find it easy to actually define itself in contrast with uh, something else because institutionally it was supposed to represent uh, the sort of prime uh, peace warrior, if you want. Now, despite that, uh, what we find is that many people, when they actually think about what it is to be European or what the European Union is, will still define it in relationship to an art group. But what is interesting is that because there is no common narrative, if you want, proposed in a top-down manner, uh, and therefore the shape of those art groups has to come from the bottom up in so many ways, people relate to very different art groups. Some people will say, well, you know, we are Europe because we are not Islam. Some people will say we are Europe because we are not the US and we've got a different social model. Some people will say we are Europe because we are not, we are not China and China is trying to actually sell all, all of its cheaply made uh, jumpers and t-shirts to us while you know, we do things the real way. Um, some people will say we are Europe because we are not Russia, or we are Europe because we are not Turkey. But you've got this sort of variety of art groups which have been allowed to flourish in a way, in part because in a top-down manner, uh, the European Union as a political system has refused in a way uh, to play the game of uh, art group nomination. I mean, the EU has never been at war with anyone. Uh, it emerged in such a way as to try and oppose war within uh, rather than war without. Um, and in many ways, um, 
it wouldn't have had the capacity in the first place to actually propose some common, um, you know, some common out groups, some common threats, because one or other of the member states would have probably opposed it. I mean, there are times when the French would have probably quite liked to assert that we are Europeans because we are not Americans, uh, but the Dutch and the Brits wouldn't have allowed the European Union as a whole to say that. Conversely, there are times when the Brits uh, might have very well say um, we are uh, European because we are not Soviet, uh, but probably the Austrians would have quite liked to keep it, you know, a bit calmer and the same with the Swedes because, in a way, they were actually into a more uh, pacifying role within uh, Europe. So, you know, we, we have that sort of lack of a top-down instruction on our art group, which has actually allowed us to um, allow different people to uh, define different um, art groups in their sort of bottom-up perception. The question again becomes, how do we perceive them? Do we actually want to characterize it? Does it actually inform us about anything or not? And that work has been done by the people who've actually been trying to create or assess the link between European identity and xenophobia, um, and between European identity and the definition of uh, migrants' rights. So people like Lauren McLaren, another of the, uh, the things you had to read uh, for today. And the notion here is quite interesting. It's the notion of whether or not people will be able to, or whether people will embrace Europeanness in such a way as to um, differentiate between essentially internal migrants, EU migrants, and third country migrants. And what will be the implications on that? So in other words, is it the case that because people feel European, uh, they will actually accept to treat other Europeans as one of us, a sort of citizenship argument? And is it the case that this will have an impact on the way they will treat non-EU migrants, either because being exposed to migrants from within would make them more tolerant of migrants from without, or on the contrary, because this uh, transposition of our political and human community to the whole of the European citizenry would result in our uh, excluding even further people coming from third countries and the rest of the world. Because in a way, if we are big enough and we are a club and we sort of shared common values and everything, then you know, there is uh, a good reason to try and keep all the others up at bay because they might actually think about life and values in a way which we don't. So that was the, you know, the next uh, element I wanted to mention, that notion of the coexistence between European identity, other identities, and perceptions of art groups. Uh, the way in which we do it is essentially, again, by measuring attitudes towards a number of citizens, looking at a number of proximity links, if you want, and looking at the way in which they sort of affect each other. And my argument here is that if you want to be able to do that in a way which is convincing, uh, then you need to make things even more complicated, and that's the sort of you know, last point uh, which I wanted to raise uh, before um, moving on to, uh, you know, to your questions and, and a sort of more open discussion in the last half hour or so. Um, I think that we need panels. I think that we need duration, and I think that we need to be able to follow people over relatively lengthy periods of time if we want to actually understand how real life affects the way they define themselves in relation to the European Union and the way they define themselves within the European Union as well. Now, this is obviously much more expensive to do, so it's quite difficult to actually get funds to actually you know, do panels. It's much more difficult to do because remember what I said about uh, the fact that when you have a typical commercial survey, even many academic surveys uh, will have uh, response rates essentially of about 15%. If you start with that sort of measure, then obviously you can't uh, really easily do a panel over several years in a row. Um, that means that technically, uh, the way in which we've tried to conceive it in the work that Sarah Harrison and myself have done is that we first try to understand a little bit better why people accept or refuse to participate in surveys, 
in order to create surveys which would be uh, more thoroughly embraced, if you want, by respondents, and would therefore allow us to do some viable panels over time. Now, this started from a very simple uh, evaluation, if you want, a very simple fact. As I mentioned the other day, I'm from Nice, and for those of you who don't know it, uh, there is beach in Nice. We've got the sea. Um, we've got lots of people coming to the beach. Now, as a social scientist, and when we actually try to get people to answer surveys, they essentially don't. They don't want to write on the phone, they don't answer on the internet, they don't actually accept to ask questions face to face. And at the same time, when you are in Nice on the beach, which I was at that time, uh, I saw people around me, all of them were actually bored, and all of them were actually reading various magazines, and in every single magazine you always have this sort of psychotest, which are essentially surveys. There are, you know, people are being asked questions, and they actually jump on them. Some people don't even read what's before, they go straight to the psychotest page, and they actually tell you everything about themselves, which is exactly what they don't want to do for the social scientist. So in a way, We've actually tried to do, and that's actually very, you know, that's the non-serious part, the very serious part is that we have actually tried to understand why people answer psychotests and not social science surveys. And we've tried to actually look at a number of ways about the way questions are being asked, about maybe the way uh, in which people are being interested in the results. We've tried to figure out uh, about the way in which questions are being ordered, um, about the ways in which, uh, you know, a number of more uh, surprising uh, or how to penetrate questions are being mixed with more serious ones. And we try to actually figure out, doing some very systematic survey experiments, how we could actually use the psychotest recipe to actually improve our uh, survey response rate. As I said, uh, the food somewhere here, uh, so far, uh, it sort of works in the sense that, you know, we have had response rates of uh, both in that project and in the electoral psychology project of over 70% of the people we attempt to ask. I think if you can see it again, I've heard your question, but they want it on record. There is Do you no have that response rate only in the first wave or also in later waves? Well, um, I mean, those are two different questions, but we actually, uh, in the, um, in the uh, European identity um, survey, for instance, between the first wave, which took place in June 2009, and the third wave, which took place in April 2012, so April, nearly three years later, um, we had a re-response rate of nearly 60%, which is actually very, very high uh, for panels. Uh, similarly, for uh, the electoral psychology, I mean, most of the panels we haven't done yet. I mean, we've done two waves, but they're sort of close to each other. The only country in which we had a third wave, which was one year later, was in the UK. And again, we had uh, a re-response rate of, I think, 75 or 78%. So I would argue it works. Uh, you know, including longitudinally. And, and again, that was in many ways, you're absolutely right, the whole point. Because I think that panels tell us things which, you know, in many ways, um, we can't really get uh, from one-shot one surveys. Because the problem with one-shot surveys is that in many ways, uh, they measure things in a given context at a given point in time. As I mentioned, one of the big queries, one of the most typical criticisms that people will address at quantitative measures of identity are, if you can measure it, it's probably not identity. And if you can measure it, you know, uh, it's probably something else, maybe just attitudes and so on. The only way in which we can say that there might be something else in what we measure is by showing that it's actually more robust, more stable over time than typical attitude measures. Now, could still be something else. I mean, it could still be beliefs, but it's hard to actually argue that the questions we ask measure beliefs. So um, typically people say either attitudes or surveys. And by doing these three-year um, measures, we find that most people are actually very stable in their answers to those identity questions over time, which in itself, I think, is actually quite an interesting uh, finding because, you know, it actually shows as well that, in a way, um, perceptions of Europeanness are progressively ingrained, if you want, in uh, people's perceptions. I'm also doing longitudinal <coughs> research. Sorry, I'm also doing longitudinal research with um, by collecting my own data, and I have similar 
numbers when it comes to you know re-interviewing the students because they're highly committed but um thank you i mean it's a lot smaller of a sample but still and what i usually um or what my first supervisor and some other people at conferences usually ask me how i still deal with the people who dropped out so i was wondering if you are actually analyzing them comparing the results of those with yeah. the and and how you do that no, I think that's a, it's a very fair point. I think that, you know, uh, whenever, regardless of the dropout, even if it's very low, you always need, and same with the, you know, with the non-response rates, um, you always need to understand who is disappearing and whether it's, you know, random or systematic. Um, chances are that in your case, it will be a bit harder to evaluate than in mine, because in mine, because we start from either random samples or representative samples, depending on the surveys. Um, in a way, we can actually look at it in terms of, you know, sort of more traditional uh, social and demographic background. In your case, because you already target a population which is um, quite specific in many ways, it will be harder. But just indeed, um, you know, I always look at who is dropping out and what difference it makes. Um, in particular, because there is always a risk in the context of identity that the people dropping out might be the people who are not interested in the question and therefore the people who are likely to be least European and that's what we want to avoid. But so far when we've actually analyzed the, the results actually both in that survey and in the, um, uh, in the electoral psychology survey the dropout was uh, as far as we could find random at least from uh, you know from most uh, traditional variables perspectives. Um, just to give you a sort of you know um, general panorama of the research as well on, on the one you, you read uh, and kind of commented on yesterday, so the, the European identity. So uh, we did, it's very difficult because uh, obviously when you, when you want to do a survey like that with sort of random sample representative samples, you, you need money. Uh, and it's hard to get money, especially at the moment, and especially if you're a social scientist. And if you're a sort of nuclear physicist, it might be easier, but we are not. Um, so we had to actually find ways of doing things which try to maximize uh, the scope of what we could do with a relatively, it's, it wasn't a small grant by any standard, it was several hundreds of thousands of euros, but, uh, but it's still, you know, it goes very quickly uh, when you actually do surveys. So what we ended up deciding to do was that um, we decided to actually do one wave only in the 27 member states. And in eight of them, we would, uh, we did, um, a second wave. In fact, it's uh, nine political. Uh, let's try the other side. It might work better. Um, so um, you know the. Um, the oh yeah, so eight countries, uh, but in fact nine political system because we include Belgium, which. Uh, is always measured as two separate political systems because of the, the two party systems. Are you Belgian? Yeah, so you, know, you cost us twice more than anyone else when you're only 10 million people. Uh, <laughs> but that's okay, we don't hate you. Uh, the, so, you know, um, and uh, so the, the first and second wave were separated by one and a half years, and the second and third year, uh, third wave by um, one year and four months, or one year and five months in total, nearly three years. Um, and, and indeed, so the you know, response rate between wave one and wave two was uh, over 70% everywhere, I think nearly 80 in some countries. And then between wave one and wave three, so that's, we then got separate funding to do a third wave in the UK. Um, then that was uh, over 60%, I think 63 or 64% from wave one, um, which is actually quite good. But, you know, when you do lose indeed a third of your sample over a three-year period, you might be very happy because it means you can actually analyze the results, but you still need to understand exactly who is dropping out and, you know, if you need be. Uh, I mean, there are ways of doing that statistically. I don't know if you found them out, uh, to, to sort of simulate what might have been the answers of the people who drop out. Okay, it's, it's, it's not perfect, but it's, if, if you have problems, if you find that, you know, indeed uh, the people dropping out are not random, uh, and that there is a risk of bias is worth actually doing these sort of things. Um, so, you know, that can actually help. 
Um, did you include open questions on the um, perceptions of uh, specific outgroups to Europe or on the, um, con on the concepts of who is considered an, uh, a European person and who not? Because I think that's a research topic that has not been much research or at least not in quantitative studies. So, yeah, maybe I was wondering if you could quantify so uh, that proportion of Europeans believe that uh, we have an outgroup with the US or whatever. Not in, not in that survey. Uh, we did some other surveys uh, at some close-ended questions on perceived that group of Europe, but not open-ended. Why not? I mean, um, I like open-ended questions. It's actually very, uh, you know, I've got more open-ended questions in my surveys than most, pretty much any survey has. Um, but those of you who do survey, I mean, how many of you are doing some sort of survey? Yes, quite a lot, uh, more than I expected in many ways. Um, and how many of you among those have any or want to have any open-ended question? Okay, so fewer. But uh, There are things you need to bear in mind when you want to actually include open-ended questions in a survey. Uh, typically, if your open-ended question is about a variable which matches to you, for instance, uh, my question about you know, what are the first three words that come to your mind, uh, when you hear the word European or when you see the European flag. Um, it's quite crucial that you put them at the beginning of the survey. Because if you don't, uh, what you do is that you really bias, you know, constrain if you want, the answers that you are going to get according to, um, you know, to the priming effects, if you want, which you will have created by asking people about a number of things. So if I start asking, say, you know, five questions about the US, and I ask questions to someone about, you know, what do you think uh, is the country which is most different uh, to the European Union model of democracy or anything, then I will sort of boost uh, the US as an answer. Um, priming within surveys is definitely important. And as a result, the problem at the same time is that obviously um, so that's the first problem. The second problem is if you don't do the survey yourself, if you use a survey company, uh, having open-ended questions will cost you much, much more than any closed-ended questions. Uh, you can count that on average with one open-ended question, uh, you could probably pay for six or seven closed-ended questions. Yeah, it's quite, you, know, uh, you need to be sure about what you are doing. The third problem is that uh, open-ended questions discourage respondents because they take longer to answer. And if someone is not particularly fascinated by the question, you can have them one open-ended question, two open-ended questions, maybe three. But when you start having six of them, then they will just stop answering. And therefore, what you will lose in terms of respondents might not totally be made up for uh, by, um, by you know, the, the meat really you are getting from the open-ended question. So open-ended, I would argue to be as interesting as possible would need to be as unbiased as possible. So, you know, I start, the first question we ask is, you know, when you look at this flag, can you tell me what are the first three words that come to your mind without, before anything, we don't, the, title, the survey doesn't have a title, it doesn't have, um, it has an introduction about, you know, anonymity and everything, but we don't mention Europe, we don't mention European identity. That's the first question we ask. Um, then secondly, that you need, you can, if you've got some open-ended questions which are of secondary interest, then you can actually cut them and put them a little bit later down the survey, but you need to know then that you might have uh, introduced some level of bias in the answers unless they're about something completely different. Um, so again, you know, that's the sort, I mean, three words in a way, it's a sort of uh, gentle open-ended uh, question. But for instance, uh, in the electoral psychology survey, one of the questions I have is, um, in one sentence, could you tell me what went through your mind when you were in the polling booth? That requires a lot of effort, you know, by service standards. I mean, it's not a lot of effort, it's one sentence, but by service standards, I mean, it does take a lot of efforts from respondents. So you can't actually, you know, do it um, that easily. So in that case, I, I do try to have uh, open-ended questions, and indeed you will have seen uh, some of the things we do from it. I mean, we do get the, you know, just uh, the quotes, which are in themselves very interesting. We do get, uh, we do the word clouds as well, which I quite find sort of, uh, interesting. I mean, you know, for instance, in the electoral psychology, 
uh, the word clouds are really telling because we ask people for the first three words they associate with elections again uh, before, about one month before an election and then just the day after. And one month before, all the answers you get, I mean, the word clouds are very negative. You get corruption, crooks, not interesting, blah, blah, blah. And then the day after, you actually get a lot of positive uh, democracy, representation, uh, exciting, happy, and everything. So in a way, that tells you something about um, the role of elections, if you want, in how people connect with their democracies in a way which you couldn't do with uh, closed-ended questions. Um, and then again, we get the quotes. So for instance, when we did uh, with Martin Holland and Natalia Shaban and again Sarah Harrison and some other people, uh, the work on external perceptions of the European Union, um, and we asked people for the first three words that come to their mind uh, when they hear the word European Union. Um, actually, many of them answered by sentences, and some of them were like really strange or funny, you know, like, uh, you know, it's things like snow snails and beautiful girls. Uh, it's like a baby, it hasn't grown up yet. And you get a lot of, you know, very, uh, I don't know, um, illustrative answers which you can use in different ways. So that's why I keep actually using them. But again, the, the sort of thing to bear in mind is the cost, financial cost for you, um, cost in terms of effort from your respondents, and cost to you in terms of how it constrains. Uh, your survey. I mean, generally speaking, and, uh, maybe I should open to some more practical, more interactive things. Again, just jump in. But for those of you um, doing, you know, your own surveys, again, always think about the scales. Do you actually want to give a middle point or not? That's a really important question. Um, think about the words. Are you using any word which wouldn't be a natural category? I mean, you know, just imagine that you are talking to your, you know, ten-year-old little nephew or niece. Just imagine that you are speaking to, uh, you know, the gentleman or lady at the bakery, just imagine that you are talking to people who are absolutely not interested in politics and in political science, how are they going to hear your question? Is it something which, are you going to start a chat, a virtual chat with them, which is good, or are you going to sort of, you know, create some tension and make them sort of reject your exercise as something which is alienating in the first place? And, uh, and again, do think about the order of the questions. Uh, always start with the more general and then go progressively to the more particular, because otherwise uh, you are going to sort of bias your answers progressively. Uh, since we have just about 10 minutes or so, maybe I'd quite like to open up a bit more, maybe on the sort of practicalities this time of, of you know, conducting surveys, either for people who do their own um, and have questions about them, or you know, for people who want to talk about existing surveys. Just on the very practical level, um, apart from the sort of chatty nature of, of the survey, instead of something that might be alienating for respondents, um, do you have any other um, recommendations for boosting the response rate? I mean, you talked about the phenomenal improvement from about 15% to, what was it, 70%? Yeah. Um, what, uh, what advice do you have on that? Well, there are a number of things. I mean, first of all, and there I'm going to open something which is very controversial. Um, I believe in minimal incentives. I believe in incentives. Um, you don't want to give incentives which are too big, because if you do, you are boosting acquiescence. But I've done several experiments about you know, those incentives. Even if you just give people a key bag, that will have an impact on your response. And the reason is that, you know, people, I mean, you're not paying them to answer you, but at the same time, you need to acknowledge that they are doing something for you. And as a result, um, you want to show them respect because that's the way in which they are going to respect your survey as well. The second reason, uh, and that's probably going to make some of you laugh, but I think it's important, is that greed is one of the best distributed characteristics on the planet. Uh, wealthy people can be greedy, poor people can be greedy. In other words, when you actually include a small incentive, you actually get a much more randomized sample than when you don't. Um, if you don't have you know, any uh, incentive at all, you end up having essentially bored people answering your survey. You know, just go and speak to uh, an 85-year-old grandmother who is on her own and hasn't actually uh, talk to anyone today, she'll be happy to answer you, then try and speak to somebody who is uh, busy and, you know, excited and has plenty of plans for the day and they won't. When, we, when you introduce greed, even at a very minimal level, like again, a tea bag or a two euros book voucher or whatever, you actually sort of 
break that cycle in a way and get a much more randomized sample than you have. Uh, secondly, again, um, the order of the questions. You don't want to ask any uh, aggressive or threatening question at the beginning, because obviously, uh, if you start asking people right away, what's your age? That's a threatening question for many people. Some people don't speak to a stranger, either face-to-face -face or on the internet or on the phone and mention their age. That's not, you know, it's just not polite to ask. Uh, being academics doesn't mean we shouldn't be polite. Um, when we start doing them, we can afford to ask them that sort of question. Um, so all these questions, you know, income, religiosity, age, basically all the demographics, they should really come at the end of the survey and not at the beginning. Um, then uh, don't waste your respondents' time. That's another important thing. So, you, know, you, you need an introduction to a survey, but you don't want to make it too long. You need to reassure them as well that it will be completely anonymous. And if you do say that, you need to respect it. I mean, in other words, uh, you don't say that something is anonymous and then handle the data in such a way that uh, wouldn't be anonymous, that would be highly unethical. Um, and then try to also include some questions which grab people's attention, uh, make them interested. Again, you know, remember that, uh, you know, I don't have any magic recipe, but just remember that, you know, leech uh, psychotest version. When we ask people about uh, ranking the seven deadly sins, for instance, they get more interested because they wonder what on earth it's about. When you ask them, you know, when we ask them about what sort of animal they would be if they were an animal, that's the sort of thing which they're interested in. Obviously, you can't waste question with um, questions you're not going to use. So only ask interesting questions that you will actually need in your analysis. But at the same time, it is still a good idea to sort of um, intersperse your harder question with the sort of more funky questions, if you want to call them that way. I think that's the sort of thing which, which can actually help. Um, I think it's also a good thing to do, um, good practice, if you want to call it that way, uh, to allow respondents to have a way of contacting you afterwards if they want. I think they are sensitive to that. And maybe even of telling them about how they could get access to the results. Um, it's also important, I mean, that's not nothing to do with um, you know, with the response rate, but uh, just in terms of the, uh, again, the ethics of doing surveys, it's a good idea to have a small debrief. So if you're not going to tell beforehand, uh, if you're going to give very general information about the purpose uh, of your questionnaire, I think it's important to also give more details um, at the end of it. I mean, you do it sort of generally first because you don't want to bias the results. Again, the acquiescence problem, but you do it afterwards because uh, of informed consent and you give people the right uh, if they're not happy with but you've just told them to cancel, in a way, their answers, which they never do, but they will appreciate the, the gesture. Um, a short and practical question. I think you've made a very strong point in favor of those multiple items measuring identity, and uh, yet I think some of us, for some reasons, have to rely on the uh, existing available data sets. Yeah. And uh, just from your experience, would you say that um, um, you know, using causal models with these existing data sets and including the existing measurements of identity, will they result in seriously flawed <laughs> results? Or would you say that um, it's, it's all right to use them? Um, it's not the best measurement, but uh, the results will probably be similar to the more extensive uh, measurement. Um, okay, my first answer is that, uh, as you say, uh, beggars can be choosers. So, you know, at the end of the day, if you don't have any alternative and that's what you need to, to use, then you will have to use it because uh, you, can't, you really don't have an alternative. Um, you won't get the same results as you would have with multiple items, that's clear. But whether you would get good enough results will essentially depend on the model. I mean, what is important, whenever you use, I mean, there is not, well, there is something wrong with fluid measurement, but uh, the social sciences as disciplines have been built around the knowledge that a measurement is erroneous anyway. We know that. I mean, if we don't know it, then we're just lying to ourselves. Uh, you can do the best efforts, and again, you can be a quantitativist, a qualitativist, a discourse analyst, it can be anything you want. Um, 
if you think that your measurement is perfect, then there is something you're just not made for that job in the first place. Um, and I think that you know we need that knowledge that our measurement is flawed originally in order to be able to proceed. And that means that the one thing we all need to do, whether our measurement is a little flawed or whether it is very much flawed, which might be the case with some of the existing items depending on the, the model, is understanding in what ways they are flawed. You know, just read about how different uh, how different people get different results depending on which uh, measures they use. Uh, what is not being captured or what is being introduced as bias in your measures. And when you do that, that will just give you the extra cushion that you need in order to be able to interpret your results in a way which is convincing. Uh, and that's why I'm saying that it really depends on the model. I mean, if, you know, let's say that, um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, one of the difficulties is uh, with the Eurobam, the Moreno question, let's imagine that's the one you're using, because again, if you want to use time series, that's the one you would find most often. Um, let's say that you are, you've been sort of convinced by my point about the tension between European and national identities being there and that shouldn't be there. If you actually use that measure of identity to explain uh, perceptions that uh, the EU is a threat to the member states, then yes, it will be a major flaw. If you use it to try and understand uh, whether people are more likely to vote in European Parliament elections, then no, it's not going to be a major flaw. So once you know what the limitations of your measurement are, you are in a much better position to know uh, if there is anything you really couldn't do with them, and if you do use them in your analysis, what sort of precautions you actually need to take into account when analyzing your data. So I guess that the, you know, a, a long answer to give you sort of rather uh, moderately optimistic uh, result at the end, which is your results will be different with those measures, but they will still be usable as long as you actually um, think about what are the limitations of the measurement and how they affect your specific model. Um, if I caught that correctly, you said you avoid um, mentioning the EU in the title of your survey. You try to mask, I guess, the uh, introductory part, not to like, have a too specific priming effect. Um, I would be interested, how do you invite or initially approach people? Um, again, how do you mask? Uh, or or do you mention you at any point? And um, do you have any kind of backlash of people feeling misled afterwards, saying we're doing you know, social something something, yep. and then they come, and, well, particularly for the UK sample, so maybe. Yeah. No, I think that, I mean, again, it depends on the on the specific survey. I mean, in some of them, we do mention the EU, uh, but we just try to be general. So, you know, we just say it's a, a survey about uh, the European election that took place the other day, for instance. Um, what we don't mention, for instance, we, I never mention identity uh, in the survey titles. Um, sometimes I mention, you know, uh, depending on, on what the, the goal and the slant of the, um, of the study when I've done the, um, the stuff which uh, you read, um, you know, the time bomb article about the effect of news and, and symbols on European identity there, I mentioned that it was about the way uh, the media inform us about Europe. So, you know, I'll always try to do it in, in a way which is factually correct. Um, but avoiding the use of specific wordings, which could be um, leading um, in, the, um, in the study. And no, we haven't had any backlash. Uh, again, in part because we, we go through the process of um, telling people, you know, that's what you're going to do with the study, and that's what the study is you know, fully about, here are more details. Um, that's uh, the way you could actually get access to the results if you want. And, um, you know, are you still happy for us to proceed? If not, we just delete your answer and you still have your incentive. So I think that, you know, most people, most human beings are reasonable. I think that, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, they don't, they will appreciate processes sometimes even more than substance. I think that if you show them that you treat them with, again, respect. And I think that, I'm, I'm, I know I'm insisting on it and it sounds really boring, but I just, I'm shocked because sometimes I think that some of our colleagues don't really show respects to participants. Uh, again, be they surveyed, interviewed, or anything. I think that you know we, we sometimes take our participants for granted, and we don't realize, you know, that we are just 
a bother to many of them. I mean, they've got better things to do with their lives than spending 15 minutes answering our survey or one hour and a half answering our interview or anything like that. Um, so, you know, they do it. It's very nice. We need them to do it. Uh, but both on their behalf and on the behalf of our disciplines, which will need participants to continue volunteering all the time, um, you know, we also need to actually be nice to them because that sort of uh, also has an impact on how they perceive uh, academia in general and, and researchers. We're running out of time. That's, uh, you know, you must be hungry by now. But thank you very much for your attention. Uh,